Brothers and sisters, as I mentioned at the beginning of Mass, today we celebrate the memorial of St. Colette. She is known as the patron saint of expectant mothers or mothers who are looking, or women who are looking to conceive. Um, But to be honest, I didn't know much more beyond that, beyond the fact that she had formed a reform of the poor Clares. So I thought we might listen a little bit to her life. So Colette was the daughter of a carpenter named De Boulay at Corby Abbey in Picardy, France. She was born on January 13th, christened Nicolette and called Colette, orphaned at 17. She distributed her inheritance to the poor. She became a Franciscan tertiary, that's a a secular Franciscan or a third order Franciscan, and lived at Corby as a solitary. She soon became well known for her holiness and spiritual wisdom, but left her cell in 1406 in response to a dream directing her to reform the poor Clares. She received the poor Clare habit from Peter de Luna, whom the French recognized as Pope under the name of Benedict XIII, with orders to reform the order and appointing her superior of all convents she reformed. Despite great opposition, she persisted in her efforts. She founded 17 convents with the Reformed rule and reformed several older convents. She was renowned for her sanctity, ecstasies, and visions of the Passion and prophesied her own death in her convent at Ghent, Belgium. A branch of the Poor Clares is still known as the Collatines. She was canonized in 1807. Her feast day is March 6th. That's... Not today. But the Franciscan calendar, it's today. So today we celebrate her as the Franciscans do. One of the things that I find interesting about that entire description is they left something out. She also founded a reform of the friars. Now why don't they mention that? I don't know. But one of the things that we see is this, that In the life of the saints, we often hear these things about, you know, miracles happening, them having ecstasies and visions and that kind of a thing. And we can think, wow, isn't that great? That's reserved for very special people. And that's not the case. Those things are what are called freely given graces, not based on a person's holiness. For a person to be considered holy, they have to produce the fruits of the Holy Spirit. They have to live a virtuous life. Those things are just gravy on top. Now, when I say that, I'm, I'm trying to make it clear that we should expect things beyond the normal because we live not just in the natural, we live united to a supernatural being. We live united to an eternal being, God. In baptism, we are united with Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us as by a temple. So we should see the glory of the Lord coming from us. We hear in the first reading that when Solomon went in the temple with the priests, something different happened. That the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Not, not just a cloud of, of incense and smoke. Because some people will be like, oh, we've got to get out of there, we can't breathe. That's not what was going on there. We're speaking about a specific appearance of God in a particular way in a temple. When we talk about temples, what do we think of? Churches, right? Right? Yes. People are nodding their heads. Okay. So sometimes we can get it in our head that, well, we should see the glory of God in the church. And we should. I think so. I think that should happen here. Since it happened in the Old Testament, why not here? If it happened in the Old Testament, it's actually kind of offensive that when we have a better covenant, those things aren't happening now. It's kind of offensive to me. Why should people with an inferior covenant have superior blessings? Well, they shouldn't. The blessings are given freely. But we want to remember something. We see Jesus walking around, and people are touching him, and the glory of God, the healing power of God, is flowing from him. Are you with me? And when Jesus was being challenged about 
giving a sign to the Jewish people that he was the Messiah, he said, tear down this temple and in three days I'll raise it back up. He was talking about the temple of his body. Who else are members of his body? Us. Are you putting it together yet? Okay. So the glory of the Lord should be not only flowing from Jesus' physical body, as it does here at the Mass, though sometimes we don't see it with our bodily eyes, with our spiritual eyes, we should certainly sense the presence of God, sense the glory of God. And I think we do. I'm, 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 I'm trying to show that we already do the, know these things and experience these things. We just may not realize that this is what's happening. Anytime we walk in here into this, into this temple, the church, on either Holy Thursday before the presence of Jesus is put back into the tabernacle or Good Friday when there is no Eucharist in the the tabernacle, the church feels empty. People note it. Yeah, it feels empty. People are nodding their head. Just like, and this is no offense to our our beloved uh, non-Catholic Christians, just like when I walk into a non-Catholic church or a a church that doesn't have a faith in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, and I walk in there, it doesn't feel the same. I'm not saying that it feels like an unholy place, but it just doesn't feel like there's the presence of the Lord. So what we want to remember is this. We are called to bring the glory of God to the nations. We are called to bring the glory of God to all the people that we encounter. When we receive Jesus today, we want to ask him to fill us with his glory. And by the way, since we are limited measuring cups, that glory, if we receive all of it, is going to overflow. Right? Right. Right? Okay. All right. Did you ever think of yourself as a leaky cup? You ever think of yourself as, as a sprinkler? You're called to bring, we're called to bring the presence of God wherever we go. This is why we receive communion. Because we are the temple of God. This is the Second Vatican Council's, not invention, but simply refocus. It's something that the early church understood. It's something that throughout the ages, when people would come back to their senses about their faith, they would come to remember, right, we bring the presence of God. All the different reforms in, throughout the history of the church, whether it was St. Colette or St. Francis or St. Teresa of Avila, miracles would break out because people were remembering that God dwells in us. And greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. So we don't have to say, oh, the world is so dark. No, no, no. You bring the light of the world. And Jesus called you the light of the world. Oh, people, people need healing. People need miracles. Yes. And Jesus said, the ones who believe in me will do greater works than I did. That's what he said. But that won't happen if we continue to think of ourselves as just people who come to get filled and then somehow it's going gonna, it's gonna, to um, run out during the course of the day. When we remember, we get filled to overflowing, so it's going to overflow for the rest of the day. It puts us in a different mindset and helps us to see the glory of God become manifest here on the earth. Amen.